Tonight we're live in Eastleigh with the polls closed in the by-election that set the two coalition parties against each other and saw UKIP apparently coming up on the rails. Welcome to Question Time. Good evening to you at home, good evening to our audience here, welcome to our panel. On our panel, the Liberal Democrat Home Office Minister Jeremy Brown, Labour's Shadow Leader of the Commons, Angela Eagle, the Conservative MP, advisor to David Cameron, Claire Perry, the former Tory MP, Neil Hamilton, who lost his seat over accusations he took cash for asking questions in the House of Commons, a charge which he denies, and he now sits on UKIP's National Executive, and the radical left-wing filmmaker, Ken Loach. Thanks so much. I should just say, uh, obviously, if we get any news from this by-election, that the polls have closed, we'll bring it to you, of course, as soon as we get it. And Andrew Neil's programme follows Question Time uh, this week, and it will stay on air until the result is announced. So let's have our first question, which comes from John Senior, please. What lessons does the bruising election campaign in Eastleigh have for the parties as they prepare for the general election in 2015? Okay, what, like, the, the election's over, so you can all speak your minds, and I hope there are people here who voted today in this election. What lessons does this campaign hold for the parties at the general election? Um, Neil Hamilton, you start... Do you think your party has come second, as some are saying, beaten the Tories into third place? Well, I have no idea. I think that Eastleigh has become a three-party marginal. That's the impression I got. I came uh, down for three separate days, and the reaction I got on the streets and on the doorsteps indicated to me that uh, there's everything to play for, for, for UKIP here. And so my message to the other parties for 2015 is get used to UKIP, because... We will be providing the real choice in that election in 2015. Labour, Liberal and the Conservatives are all led by Euro-fanatic leaders and they're all wholly committed to membership of the EU, which stops us doing so much which we would otherwise like to do, like ending open-door immigration, for example, and cutting green taxes and so on and so forth. And you don't believe the Prime Minister when he says he'll have a, a referendum on Europe? I think it's probably about as believable as the cast-iron promise of a referendum he gave before the last election, on which he reneged afterwards okay. on the Lisbon Treaty. All right. Claire Perry. Well, it may have been bruising for politicians, but my goodness, I'm really personally sorry for the amount of rubbish I've put through your doors and contributed to your recycling. You must be very happy that the caravan <laughs> is moving on. Um, so apologies from all of us. Um, a couple you of mean things. you bored the electorate, did you? Well, I think we, uh, we overwhelmed the electorate with information. Is that true? And probably... <laughs> yes. <laughs> really? Um, and actually, there were some great leaflets out yesterday saying, I've made my mind up, just go away. And I thought that was excellent. Um, a couple of things. I think we all sit in Westminster and have really detailed, important conversations about, you know, the deficit coming down by a quarter, or in fact, immigration, which is down 30% year on year. But people are busy. They have busy lives. They are not all tuning in to watch political programmes. Some people don't even have a chance to read a paper and actually what we need to be talking about is the things that matter to people which is cost of living local issues and so if the lesson that we should take away is if we're trying to talk about the big important stuff like fixing Britain we have to keep making it relevant no one here tonight is going to go home and say hooray the deficit is down by a quarter isn't the government doing well you're going to go home I think and think about filling up your car tomorrow what's going to happen to fuel duty in the budget and we have to keep getting out of Westminster, getting into our constituencies, and just being normal so and you, listening to what people are saying. You are you saying fuel duty is going to come down in the I'd budget? Like, well, we've frozen it every single time. Is it going to come down? A, well, we have frozen Labour's planned duty increases. We've spent five billion helping motorists. I would love it to come down, but it's a constant battle, as you know. And, and between let us in on a secret, because you've obviously talked to your people tonight. Do you think you have come third? I have no. To, to UK? Well, I you must will have be, some idea. You I would be. love to see some fantastic more fantastic women in Parliament, frankly, across all parties. And I think if we don't get Maria in, we're missing a chance to get in a really great female candidate. So but you don't think you, you don't if think she hasn't won? If she hasn't won? If she hasn't won. Right, OK. Uh, do you think the Liberal Democrats have won, Jeremy Brown? Uh, I don't know, but... Um, don't know, but do you think? Well, I, I hope we have. But yes, I, I mean, I, no, that's obvious, too. Well, I don't... I mean, I've got... <laughs> I've, got I've, I've spoken to the headquarters in this. You've I've got, got thousands no, of people in this constituency. As everybody here will testify, you know, the parties have fought themselves to a bit of a standstill. But 
I think, the, I think the big message is, you know, you look at the opinion polls, you look at the difficulties the parties in government have trying to get our country back on its feet in extremely difficult times. You look at the circumstances, let's be blunt about it, but, um, under which this by-election was called. And I don't think anybody, whatever party you voted for, would think the Lib Dems had had a good week in terms of national media coverage. So against that backdrop, the big story for me is not that the Lib Dems are crumbling away. The big story is the resilience of the Lib Dems, that we are a feature in the political landscape. I think we had the best candidate. I think that was accepted by people who didn't even vote for him. Uh, we're the party who I'm are sorry. around year on year, day in, day out, not just turning up to fly the flag at election time. I think a lot of people appreciated that level of service and the care that we showed to the people in this community. And I hope that that will be a winning combination and that we will show people tonight that the Lib Dems are alive and kicking and okay. an important part of the political landscape of this country. Let's hear from, maybe from one of the people who voted. You, sir, the spectacles there. Uh, one comment on the, uh, the literature that came round. To my mind, it was lots of pretty pictures, of mainly of candidates and sometimes of green fields, uh, that actually said very little. You know, it was, it was, there was lots of paper with not a lot of uh, did, did, information Did on you it. vote today? Yes, I did. How did you make your mind up? Um, Were you torn at all between these four parties? Fourteen yes, parties. I was. Quite, fourteen quite, parties. Actually, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Well, well fourteen I candidates. Didn't, I didn't vote for any of the minor contenders because although some of them had some very interesting points, they clearly weren't going, weren't to get, in, weren't going to get in, and it, was, it would have been a wasted vote. Um, personally speaking, I regret that Chris Hewn is not still standing. I think I think he was uh, a, a politician of great significance. Right. Um, with what I felt was a very strong view, uh, which I agreed with, on climate change and energy policy. And I think we have lost a, a considerable personality there. OK. Andrew Eagle. Well, I don't think anyone could say um, that this is our biggest ever prospect uh, in the country. I think uh, we, we would have a majority of 362 if we'd taken Eastley. But what we've done is fought a vigorous campaign, uh, gone round, talked to a lot of people about the things that matter to them. There's no doubt that immigration's been a big issue in the campaign here, and we've had uh, discussions about what we can do to uh, deal with that, to bring it down, to ensure that no uh, foreign worker should take a job at less than minimum wage and be exploited and forced down people's wages, uh, that we can deal with exploitative uh, agencies w who only employ uh, foreign but what, people sorry, and bring them in. The question was what lessons does this campaign, even though you... To get out on the doorstep, and talk, and listen, find out what's going react. On. But I think, you know, Claire uh, wants Maria to win, but I actually think that it's a lot more important than that for the Conservative Party. Uh, this is their 16th target Lib Dem seat. They need to win this seat so they can win the next election. Uh, I think it's 258 on our list. So if the Conservatives tonight fail to take the seat in the circumstances that Jeremy's alluded to, the difficult times that the Liberals have been having, I think that'll be a tremendously worrying okay, result well, for them. Sorry, wait, 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 and, I also, wait, I and I also think no, if you second, could come second yeah. and, the, and the Conservatives come third, then they've got a right to be very worried. In well, uh, the, the late, this is only informal, but the latest tweeting from a Liberal Democrat councillor is that Liberal Democrats have held the seat and UKIP has gone second and the Conservatives in well, third Well, I think that, that's meltdown well, that, in the Conservative well, Party. Got, last last, this last is, time the Conservatives won an overall general election majority, they won Eastleigh with a majority of 18,000. So let's see if they manage to do that. Well, Mind you, the last time, last time there was a by-election in Eastleigh, yes, Labour had no leader and, and they finished second. No, now they've got everything well, about well, 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 you can just can let you um, second. You, know, Ken, I, I, uh, you come in now and then I'll come uh, to you. I, that news. I do think it's much more serious than this. Um, the Westminster tittle-tattle that we're just listening to is what puts people off politics. I think it's much more serious. I think, I think there's a, a lot of people in this country who have, share a lot of thoughts. They hate the breakup of the National Health Service. They hate the privatizations and the outsourcing and the labor agencies and the low wages. They hate the mass unemployment. <coughs> they hate the casual destruction of the environment that we see and the gentleman referred to. 
And there isn't, there isn't a broad movement, a broad party that they can vote for. People spend a lot of time saying, who are we going to do? Who are we going to hold our nose and vote for? And I think we need a broad movement on the left. And the one thing I would have in common with Neil is, is that UKIP has done it for the right. I disagree with almost everything that UKIP stands for. <laughs> but, but we need a broad movement of the left. And it's now time it came together. And so how, would you, how would you get that? Because well, every time the party yes. moves to the left, it's, historically it seems to have lost votes. Well, I, I think there are a number of things that should happen. Um, I think the, labor, the unions should stop paying money to a party which is going to kick it in the teeth. Because it, it's doing, the Labour Party is a market economy party. It won't look after the interests of working people. So I think the, the Labour Party should cut off that tap and we should start again like this started over a century ago and form a new Labour Party. Now, there will be a problem because, of course, there was an anti... Uh, 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 protecting the NHS candidate here, I'm sure, was, did very good things and said good things. There was a trade union candidate. But they get no presentation. Every time I turned on the BBC or ITV to see the election discussed, you never heard that point of view. So there's got to be a... Uh, there's got to be a determination that the, the left has its voice because it's excluded at the moment. Okay. You sit in the middle there. Yes, the gentleman over there just alluded to the surprising number of um, independent and minority parties that have stood in this election. And as we've just heard, there's a very poss great possibility that um, UKIP may have surprisingly come second. Sorry, Neil. Um, the... I love you too. <laughs> the, um, is that a symptom of part of perhaps the electorate being sick of uh, the big three parties? Is there well, a, a so many people stand. But well, not, absolutely. Is there a certain frustration? I, mean, that, I, I think there, what, there what, is a serious point here. That, I, I mean, there's a huge degree of voter alienation in this country. I entirely agree with Ken. We're going to have a big love in here from our different <laughs> sides of the political spectrum. Uh, the vast majority of the people of this country uh, have lost faith in our political system. When I was young, 85% of the country voted in a general election. Last time it was down to 60%. You know, the lifeblood of political parties has been sucked out. They right. no longer represent real people. Ken was quite right. This Westminster tittle tattle they're all career politicians, or not all. Claire wasn't a career politician. But, but there's so much careerism in politics today. Well, you don't have the trade unionists in Parliament. You don't have the small yes, business do. concerns. Not well, not, okay. not as we used it's to do in, all right, in the all right. 60s. Neil, hold on. Uh, and, and, so, and so I think the big issue, you know, if we go back to the, what, what lesson are we going to learn from this campaign, is that the politicians have got to be real again and not be in this bubble in Westminster, wholly remote from ordinary okay. people. Mr. And of course, that's right, your European point. point. Thank you. Even worse. We get your point. Claire Perry. Thank you. I mean, third I, I, is what we're told well, that well, Conservatives we'll are going it to be. A, well, of course, we'll see. But what would okay. the effect of that it's be on the Tory, it's a on the Tory party the last, and on, and on the Prime Minister? The last time the governing party won a by election was during the Falklands War, well, when some people were still in party. Well, luckily. But can I just go back to Ken's argument? Let's let Ken, you're a national treasure, and we love your films. But let's not let the facts. <laughs> you know, let's not let your story get in the way of the facts. You talk about mass unemployment. Unemployment is coming down. How you much is may it? I finish? How, you talk about an NHS is scandal. How Where is, is the apology from the Labour Party for mid staffs, for the appalling things that happened under Labour's watch? And look, I completely accept that politics is broken. All of these people have been in Parliament a much longer time than me. And what we need is people who come in, who are committed to transparency, who absolutely want to fix Britain. And if you look at what's happening between our two parties who came together in the national interest things are improving and it's tough and it's tough medicine across the Europe it's of not Europe. working yes it Claire. is working growth no, is isn't. increasing and unemployment's coming growth down. is not increasing right, it's hold on. We'll come, wait 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 we'll come to we'll come to the economy in just a moment <laughs> don't ask Angela what you do as a sideline we'll come to it in a moment but I just hear for a couple more members One of idea. the public you sir up there and then you down here I think the problem is, is that there's no there's no alternative is there people have voted for UKIP because it's an alternative it's different it's you know you've got the Labour you've got Conservative Green you've got the Liberal Democrats <laughs> they're just different colors there's no sort of different there's no, no real choice you mean. There's, no, you mean there's no real choice I mean right. and just, you, yeah, sir. It's all skewed okay in a similar vein, getting to the by-election campaign, the three main parties, um, I, I voted for Mike Thornton, but 
uh, all the three main parties did sound very scripted. Uh, I know Mike's got a lot to say, but uh, on the campaign trail, they all sounded similar. And I'd like to congratulate, I think, uh, the Labour candidate. I didn't vote for him, but at least he came across as fallible, funny, interesting, and, you know, uh, willing to talk about his own agenda. And, and a loser. And a loser, yes. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll take, I'll take one more point, and then we'll go on to another, yeah. another question, broaden this thing out. Yes, yeah, thanks. Actually, I, to the Labour Party uh, candidate, um, Donna Farrell. Yes, yeah. uh, I, th I thought the quote in his book about Margaret Thatcher um, was probably the most vile thing I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. And how anyone could ever put me as a candidate was beyond me. And then we had the Conservative uh, candidate who actually was given a potted history of Roman Eastley, which made the ro all the Eastley residents laugh with, with, with gusto because it was just a field. Who did you go for? Lib Dem. Well, I would have done. I'm actually a Lib Dem councillor. <laughs> oh, <I see. laughs> That's a surprise. Oh, planted audience. Planted, yeah. planted in, in yeah. disguise. Right. That's because we're so many Lib Dem yeah. oh, <laughs> One, one of the 14, up. easily. <laughs> if we get any more news from the by-election front, I'll let you know it. But let's have this question from Michael Fitzgerald, please. Following the loss of the AAA rating, is it now not time to step down the austerity and concentrate on growing the economy? Right, and let's um, stick to this point about whether the government should change its policy the, uh, the, the, with the loss of the AAA rating, and let's not trade too many statistics that are incomprehensible to anyone except the person using them. Claire Perry. Well, I think, you know, no one is celebrating that we've lost a measure of, uh, of Britain's, um, you know, responsibility, if you like. But if you look, I guess the question that I constantly wrestle with, and one of the reasons I came into politics, is we know we had a borrowing crisis. And we can either borrow more, and I've yet, I'd love to hear Angela explain how borrowing more means you borrow less, because I don't understand that. Or we can tackle this enormous deficit so our children don't have to. And, if you, and basically what's happened since the election is that the global growth forecasts have all been downgraded. We've had a headwind of slow growth across the world that has hit Britain's ability to grow. But what the government is trying to do is stop spending money on things that don't deliver value and just focus forensically on investment in infrastructure. You're seeing it here. We're seeing it in the southwest. Well, you should shake your head. We're spending half a billion quid uh, in terms of new rail links to the southwest. We're spending an enormous amount in, in terms of cross rail and high speed rail. We're trying to build our way out of this recession. And you know what? We've created a million jobs, sir, in the private sector since the election. It is working. It is slow. It is difficult. And I would love to How hear How do you lose your AAA rating if we, it's working? Well if, well, if you actually read the small print, it says this, if, you, if we did not have this commitment to sorting out Britain's problems, the rating would go down even right, further. Man up there at the back. And let me just say, by the way, if you want to join in this debate, Remember, text or Twitter, our hashtag BBCQT, you probably know that. We've got a Twitter panellist tonight, uh, which is the blogger Mark Wallace. His, his day job is head of media at the Institute of Directors. But you can follow him at BBC Extra Guest, and you can text comments to 83981. Press the red button to see what others are saying. I should have said that earlier. Yes. Yes. You, sir, at the back there. For Claire to say losing a measure of our, um, our credit rating, it's a measure that her party thought was very important. By her party's own reckoning, this is a disaster and this is a complete failure of the government's policy, surely. The other side of the coalition, take up the cudgels on behalf of the coalition. Like every Western economy, we have a huge fight on our hands. And the question is, are we up for that fight, not as a government, but as a country, or are we running away from it? Do we lose our nerve? And I, I tell you, I think we have to be up for that fight because all of these countries right across the Western world have a pretty dire economic outlook. And unless governments show the resolve to get to grips with that and to balance the books, the situation will get worse rather than better. When this coalition government was formed in 2010, almost three years ago, for every three pounds that the government was raising in tax, it was spending four pounds. That is completely unsustainable. I don't care whether it's your household or your business or your country. You can't live beyond your means indefinitely. So we are having to turn that round. And we are making progress. The deficit is down by a quarter. I wish it were down by more, but it is down. About a million jobs have been created in the private sector. We have low interest rates. 
But is this going to be achieved overnight? No. And nor is it being achieved overnight in other countries right across Europe. They've, they've had a general election, very quickly, they have a general election in Italy this week. They, I don't think, are going to be able to form a coherent coalition government that can get to yeah, grips with their economic that, problems. Hang on, hang on, we Jeremy, in this country have, and that's the difference the, the, the between The difference us and them. is, for all the rhetoric, it was George Osborne who made this the first of his eight conditions for the economy. It was he who said the AAA rating was what he was going to be judged by. So it's not, it's not, it's not just one. nothing. David, what are you well, saying? Well, no, hang on. Well, let's hang on. Well, let's hang on. Well, let's hang on. Sorry, I mean, sorry. We, very we, quickly, see, so you were just asked. The, the, the two major economies, <laughs> the two major economies that have the top rating are Germany and Canada, and, and they are the two countries that have got right. grips with their deficit. Uh, so we, 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 okay. we, we, Andrew, 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 we have right. no, 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 resolve Andrew, Andrew, to sort this situation out. We've now had two government spokespeople talking about this, but the fact is that the loss of the triple rating is a total humiliation for a, a Chancellor. He's failed a test that he set himself as the number one priority in the Tory manifesto, and that's because his economic policy is failing. He's flatlined the economy. There's no growth because he sucked the life out of the economy. And what would you now, do? Both, would you borrow more, both Angela? Of, both would you borrow more? Claire, let well, me just answer. answer the no, stop interrupting me. Um, the, the, the issue the here. Is no. The, the issue here is that the government's policy is failing. You say, Claire, that there's been a million uh, new jobs created, but you've sacked 520,000 people from the public sector. You've reclassified 200,000 people uh, from the education sector into the private sector. So one in five of the half a million extra jobs that there are are actually fiddled. Well, there are more jobs. And then... What you would, are, there are you uh, over a million people who want more hours, who are underemployed, what would you who can't do? get hours, who are suffering squeezed mm. living standards. What would you do? The issue is we have to ask the question. The answer we, is you have no policies, Andrew. Claire, <laughs> let no me policies. chair this. You just <laughs> answer. <laughs> you, may, you may get on very well with the Speaker. You'll get on less well with me if you don't accept my chairmanship. Of course. Because you can't talk over everybody. I think she's doing a pretty good job so far. Um, I, I think that what we have to do is have a fiscal stimulus. We have to try to put people back to work. So we have to cancel the uh, tax cut for millionaires that's coming uh, in uh, April no and actually use, uh, in, introduce a Tempe tax rate. We can do you, all sorry, do, simply, by, not this by do you borrow more or not? Well, the there is good borrowing and bad borrowing. Oh. If you borrow to invest in infrastructure, to build houses, to put unemployed construction workers back to work, to create a place where pe people who are homeless can live, that is good borrowing. That's if you quick borrow £212 billion pounds extra because your economic policies are failing and the economy has ground to a halt, that is bad so borrowing. So your, your response would be to borrow more? You in, have in to borrow right. some more in the short term for right. good things, to put people back to work, to create infrastructure. The uh, number of employment. Hands up, but Claire of, Perry yeah. said that they were investing in rail. All of that investment is in the next parliament. HS2 isn't going to happen until uh, the mid uh, 2020s and not finish and reach the okay. north until yep. 2035. That is not investment that's going to get us out of the difficulty and the lack of growth that N we're Neil in Hamilton. now. Well, shall I introduce an air of reality into this discussion? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> because uh, uh, because uh, the reason why the government has lost its triple A rating is, is because the ratings agency think that they haven't got to grips with the deficit. And they're right. You would think that there have been massive cuts from the way that this discussion has gone so far. Actually, government spending has increased since the last general election. Thank it was you. 670 billion in 2010. It's 737 billion this year. The deficit three years ago was 190 billion. This year, the deficit will still be 130 billion pounds. These are colossal sums of money. We cannot go on burning money in this way. Hard decisions have to be taken. And Angela Eagle's policy is, of course, preposterous that we have to borrow our way out of debt. That is not what which, I said. Which is Don't exactly, it I, is exactly I said, what, what is being I said. said if, that there if, are we, if we, if, if we had a government that was, if we had a Labour government committed to that policy, you wouldn't have a double A rating. You'd have a double. Z rating uh, from, from, the, from the ratings agency. <laughs>
And that, of course, would make it far more uh, expensive for everybody to borrow. It would actually be the kiss of death for the economy. And Jeremy was quite right in pointing out that Canada and Germany are, have got the triple A rating because they have got to grips with their financial problems. They've got surpluses. All right. Let's hear from some members of our audience at the back there, in the middle there. Now come to you, Ken. Yes. Um, the lady said that um, we need to get more construction jobs in this country. However, I'm unemployed and I look on the Job Centre website for jobs and I would say almost half of the jobs are for construction places. I'm the most um, available jobs are for construction and nurses. So there is, an, there is obviously places for people to work and if you're building the high-speed railways and things like that, you're not making jobs, you're just moving people from some to others. But not jobs suitable for you? No, I, no. I couldn't go and start bri laying bricks because no, I don't wait, have wait. the right, qualifications. And, right, the person there, and just under, in the centre on the camera, you can say I, yes. Can I just go back to An um, Angela's, uh, what's good borrowing or bad borrowing? So what would you describe the past Labour government's borrowing? Is it good borrowing or bad borrowing? Well, I think that the, the, the issue here is if you're going to borrow money to do things uh, that help the country in the future, like build infrastructure projects at very low interest rates, capital expenditure, then that's a good thing. It re so the brown the economy. borrowing was good borrowing? It re-equips yes. the economy. Yeah. Was it? It, it, it re-equips the economy. I'll tell you, we didn't have a, a, a recession and a crisis, a banking crisis, in 38 countries because we spent too much on schools and hospitals. Right. Ken Loach. Um, it's a massive failure. Uh, it was, uh, Osborne said there was a test, he failed. Uh, the structural, insofar as I understand these things, the structural deficit um, is also, has gone down a bit, but only through creative accounting and one-off sales like the Royal Mail pensions. So actually they're failing on every front. But really, you know, the economy lives in people. It doesn't just live in statistics, it doesn't live in politician speeches, it lives in people. And we have an economy which is, is in a terrible state. We have two and a half million people out of work, no work. A million of them are young people. What future are we giving to them? And we, of course there are all these cuts. The, uh, the, 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 the a thousand people, the thousand richest people since the crisis began, their wealth has increased by 155 billion pounds. The range in inequality is massive. And meanwhile, the bottom 10%, the poorest families, through these cuts, their average income is being cut by 30%. Now, this is 30% of nothing. Okay. So people are living on air. So, yes, we have to change. Yes, the economy has to change. We need a whole new economic strategy that puts work and gives people a decent That's life gross. and the way of living a, in a decent way. Because we're not doing it at the moment, and the free market will not do it. It cannot do it. You never hear um, politicians now talking about full employment. Never, because they know they can't provide it. Right. And if we can't give our kids the, the prospect <laughs> of a life, a secure life with work, then they failed. And they failed. Claire Perry, a brief, a brief <laughs> repost for that. We're going. I, I, I mean, Ken, I think it's a very interesting concept, but you know, we are at a point where what is it we want people to do? Do we want to grow our way out of this recession? And by the way, doing. the right thing to do, Andrew, would have been to put some money aside when times were good, yeah, so yeah. when tough times hit, there was All something. Right. Can you answer Ken Loach's um, point? But, are we going to have full you, employment again well, under are, your system? Are, are we going to. Yeah, keep under your market eco economic system, will you ever see full employment are again? Are we going to keep training kids in the right things? Are we going to get them back into work in manufacturing? You're talking down the British economy. We are exporting more cars now than we've done since the 1970s. Well, all foreign, yeah. well it doesn't matter. We're still employing British people to do it. I mean, what is it? What is the answer? Do you want to employ everybody in the state? We tried that. We've tried. We employed a lot of people under Labour in the state. We have to have private sector growth dragging yeah. us out of the recession. It, it and right. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. The woman here in the front. The woman here in the front. Very much. The woman here in the front. The woman here in the front. Back to Claire's original point. If AAA is not bad, at what point is the rating bad that the government would worry about it? Okay. Is it an A, a B? 
All right. Well, I take that as rhetorical because I don't think you'll get a benchmark <laughs> given to you. The woman in the front <coughs> row there. Um, yes. I'd just like to ask, um, you guys seem to be bandying around a lot of rhetoric and figures, but you don't seem to realise that the practical results of the losing, well, losing AAA rating, the recession at the moment, is that in the local area we're losing 800 jobs at Ford, which no politician thought for. <laughs> Not a single one of you fought for that. Um, and the local um, unemployment ratings in all the major cities have gone up, so that unemployment rating sucks as well. One more point from the woman there. Yes, yes. One of the other effects is the, straight away on the back of that um, credit rate dropping, we, we had lost, was it 26 out of the 28 housing associations had their credit rating drop the next day. So they are no longer a good investment to mm. people with money. So there's going to be no more mm. social housing mm. built. It's just... Well, mm. again, and, and, the, and, the, and the BBC had its credit rating mm. drop. Did you see that? No, I didn't see that yes, one. Yes, today, the BBC's <laughs> properties in London and in Salford have had their credit rating reduced because they don't know what's going to happen to the BBC. Um, I, I want to go on now to another, another question because we, 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 go, we talk about the economy every week and <laughs> we rarely get much further. Uh, this is from <laughs> Angelica right. Finnegan, please. Is the British political system a safe place for women to work? Is the British political system a safe place? <laughs> it's the allegations against Lord Renard, uh, that, uh, the former chief executive of the Liberal Democrats, that obviously led to this, allegations that he absolutely denies. But um, Jeremy Brown, is the political system a safe place in the light of everything we've been hearing? Um, well, the question is clearly aimed, as, as you just uh, say, David, at the um, revelations which have been extensively covered in the media this week. And let me, um, let me put it like this. When I joined the Liberal Democrats, I joined the Lib Dems, um, this makes me a career politician, when I, was, uh, when I was 18 years old. And I joined the Lib Dems because I believed in the values of the party. I believed in uh, liberalism. I believed that you could combine being responsible with the economy with having an enlightened, uh, compassionate, a uh, generous-spirited society where people could be free but could also realise their full potential. And I want people who share those instinctive liberal values, regardless of whether they're men or women or their ethnicity or their age or whatever else it might be, to feel that they can join the Lib Dems, be a member of the Lib Dems, be a Lib Dem councillor or stand for Parliament for the Lib Dems. And if people, and it sounds like that was the case, if there are people in this case uh, women who feel that they couldn't pursue their Lib Dem values, their liberal instincts within the Liberal Democrat Party. That is wrong. That is profoundly wrong. And it's a source of great regret to me and to the party as a whole. And we are uh, now going to have two inquiries, one into these specific allegations and one into our overall internal uh, complaints procedures. And in a way, there's no more I can really say about it at this stage. Those inquiries have to run their course. As, as David said, Lord Renard uh, has denied the uh, allegations that have, been, that have been made, and obviously it's uh, only reasonable that uh, everybody concerned should have a fair hearing as part of that process. But we are very committed to making sure that people who share our liberal values and instincts mm -hmm. should have a home in the Liberal Democrats. And do you think Nick Clegg handled it well? Because he seemed to be all over the place for about four days, saying one thing and then another and then another and then another. For me, I think, you know, uh, the sort of rolling media story about who said what to whom at what point and who can remember what happened at what point isn't, isn't the central feature. To me, the central feature is that the women who make these allegations uh, understandably feel uh, upset, they feel aggrieved. Uh, they're allegations that we take seriously and that is why Nick Clegg and the Liberal Democrats have set up these two inquiries and they will be full thorough inquiries and we will get to the bottom of the truth and, uh, and obviously we want to make sure that the Liberal Democrats are a party that, that are um, appealing to women as well as, as male members and I hope and I believe that that will uh, also help the sort of political culture right across the board because I'm not just saying this to deflect attention but I don't think that this is a situation which is unique to one particular political party and I hope it leads to wider cultural change. Woman down the right. Um, 
I don't believe that you're taking it seriously. Actually, I don't think that um, the way that it's obviously with Nick Clegg being uh, trying to avoid it was taking it seriously. Um, and I don't think this is just going to be a problem in the Lib Dems. I'm actually very concerned as somebody that is interested in politics. I'm doing a PhD in politics and I teach a lot of students parliamentary and constitutional politics in Britain. And I don't know what to tell some of the girls in my class because I don't believe that they're going to have the right opportunities uh, to pursue a career in politics. And I don't know whether I'd encourage them either. Uh, Angela Eagle, what light can you throw on this? Well, I think it's unacceptable that women are put in this position and it shouldn't be tolerated in any uh, political party, in any workplace and in our society more generally. I think this is an issue that's often not talked about and, and it needs to come to the surface and be dealt with. Women who are victims of this need to be taken seriously and treated with respect. All too often in many workplaces and many instances we know that women are basically pressurised into not saying anything because they know the consequences for them will be worse than the consequences for the perpetrator. This is about the behaviour of men. And, and, and in many ways, men need to stop and think about this and see that it's unacceptable. And we need to develop different norms in our society. If this uh, issue and the way that it's come out helps us do that, then all, all the better. But there are too many places in our society that are male-dominated, where the power structures are male-dominated, and where this kind of unacceptable behaviour towards women goes on and is tolerated. And we need to put an end to it. And do you include... <laughs> do you include the Labour Party in those strictures? Uh, well, I... It, I've just said it happens everywhere and we've all got to ensure that we've got the right uh, processes in place to put a stop to it. I think that it's um, far less tolerated in some places than others. Feminism, that word, uh, we have made progress in some places more than others. In the Labour Party we have women only shortlist. We've had some big instances about women's uh, uh, advancement and equality in the Labour Party. I think we're further along than many other places. We're often derided for it, though. Harriet Harman has been a doughty fighter for women's rights and their rights not to be treated like uh, this in all her years in Parliament, and she's derided as Harriet Harperson. We were all called Blair's babes, Cameron's cuties. The way that politics is covered is not acceptable. Women need to be treated with respect for their own political ideas and until we change our culture it's very very hard for us to get the 51 percent of people in this country that have a, a, a right to be involved in politics and change the culture of our politics which is what we all know we need to do If we can do that we can change our country right. far faster and far more of a profound way than has happened to date so uh, let's get to it women let's all get going and sort this out yes. Um, I'd like to just ask, how do you actually, how do you propose that you go about doing that? Because I believe a few years ago you tried that and, and you were hit by a legal pursuit, I believe, uh, in trying to, women, to shortlist women. Women only shortlist, yes. Claire Perry. We changed the law and they're legal. Thank you. Angelica, thank you for the question. I think the fascinating thing in all this coverage is if this had been a female of any note, there would have been lots of commentary about her appearance, her age, whether she'd lost weight. I mean, this chap is not a looker, let's be clear, and nobody has mentioned that. But I have to say, well, just I did, just, well, and I'm probably the first person that's done it. I completely agree with Angela. This is, I think that this is an endemic problem in all institutions that don't have enough women in it. And ladies, please, I don't care what political party you are part of, what level of politics you get into, just get involved. Because if our voices aren't there, nobody else is speaking up for us. Are and that is the only way it changes. Um, we ha I was selected under, I don't, I think 50-50 uh, is the system I was selected under. I think that is fair. I think the problem we have is we don't have enough women coming through the political system of all ages, of all types, and that's what we have to change. To back to your original question, yes, it's safe to go into politics. I'd rather be a female MP than, uh, in Britain than I would in Italy or Afghanistan, <laughs> but we can do a lot, lot better than we're doing now. So please, ladies, get involved and make your voices heard. All right. Men have the to man, change too. Though. The man up there. In the, in the, 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 the central right. issue here is, though, that the, the Lib Dems turned a blind eye to this, didn't they? This is what Nick Clegg, you know, it's clearly happened over the past few days, is that you know, his recollection is just the fact that he turned a blind eye to it, as did the senior 
Lib Dems. That will be true in the Savile case as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's something else about this that peeps not just about the treatment of women. It's about the fact that actually people aren't owning up to it and, or seeing it in the workplace and, uh, and you know, and, and doing something about it. Ken, Ken Loach. Um, yes, I, the, the only thing I, I'd add to what Angela says, which I agree with, um, is it's, it's about power and it's a form of bullying. Um, and it's the abuse of power by people who are in a superior position against people who are in an inferior position in the hierarchy. And so they fear for their jobs, they fear for their careers, they fear that, um, that something bad will happen to them within the organisation, and that's, that's wrong. And I think it, it's, it's the abuse of power, and it, I think there are cases where, where women have been involved. I don't think it's in... I mean, mainly men, I, I grant you. Yeah. And uh, whether the guy is good-looking or not is really not the point, and that was a cheap shot. I, I think we've got to be much more serious than that. And I think we've got to be much more serious than that. It is, it is an absolute evil in, our, in big organisations, and we've all seen it at different times. And we, everyone, Angela's right, everyone has to stand up and say this is not on. And I agree, there has been a bit of a cover-up. And the other thing I wanted to say is that not, we can't lump all sex scandals together. This is not pedophilia. It's not the Savile issue. We can't put them all into one thing and say, yes, um, they're all as bad as each other, because plainly they're not. And it doesn't help to think that there is one set, of, that everything to do with the sex scandal is the same. It's not. But Ken, do you but think that something's happened as a result of the Savile exposures, which is it has been followed by more and more allegations of various kinds of sexual um, harassment, which yes. we'd never heard before? Yes, I, I, th I think it, it, it could well be that. Um, and the danger of that, of course, is that there's then a witch hunt. And, and that's also a danger because people are innocent until yeah. they've, till they've been proved guilty. And we mustn't forget that as well. Yeah. 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 Yes, I think the, um, the, the, the issue about a zero tolerance towards um, sexual discrimination is, isn't really contentious. And it's a very important point. And I don't want to dismiss it, but I'm, I don't want to use it as an excuse to ignore the fact that Nick Clegg lied. And, you know, I think in this age where yeah. the trust between the electorate and the politicians is at an all-time low, expenses scandals and all those sort of things, and Chris Hume was a liar, you know, despite what the gentleman said earlier, so in a way I'm pleased he's gone. But, you know, Nick Clegg lied, and, you know, we just shouldn't ignore that. What when, was when his Paul, lie? Well, that he said he didn't know anything about it, and then it's emerged that he does. And I just think it's unforgivable, and people need to just say, that's wrong. And, uh, you know, after his I'm sorry video, it doesn't really feel like he is. <laughs> Jeremy Brown, can you answer that specific point? Then I come to you, Neil. That, that well, he lied. My, well, my understanding is, is not that. My understanding is that the differentiation that uh, Nick Clegg made was between understanding broad rumours that were within an organisation or hearing those rumours uh, and knowing about specific allegations that he could act on. And there is a distinction between those two. But I've already said uh, that any person who feels that they have liberal values and wants to pursue that through the Liberal Democrats, but doesn't feel able to, for whatever reason, including this reason, that's wrong. And that's why we're having these inquiries, and that's why we want to change that culture if it exists. So, you know, I'm up front about that. I acknowledge that. And... We need to learn from what's happened. Neil Hamilton. Well, I have a rather unusual sidelight on this. I think I may be the only member of the panel who's actually been arrested by the police on suspicion of rape. Uh, uh, True. One of many false allegations that I've had to put up with in the course of my life. One thing you can say about the Hamilton household is it hasn't been dull. Uh, <laughs> and the girl who, uh, who accused me of rape ended up uh, serving a three-year prison sentence. Uh, for perjury and perverting the course of justice. Uh, but I agree with all that's been said on the panel this evening, and particularly by, by Ken a, a moment ago, uh, that the kind of antediluvian attitudes which have been exposed, admittedly Lord Reynolds, uh, Reynolds has uh, denied these allegations, but there are ten separate women who've come forward with allegations, um, and that certainly raises a few eyebrows, doesn't it? And then you get extraordinary responses to these allegations, such as the one from Lord Greaves, reported in this evening's Evening Standard, who apparently is a Liberal peer, who said, uh, apparently, that um, 
If this sort of behaviour was really found to be a resignation matter, about half the male members of the Lords over 50 would probably not be seen. Well, that doesn't seem to me to be the appropriate response to... That doesn't seem to me to be the appropriate response to uh, what are very serious and distressing allegations. And it's that kind of attitude which should be extirpated in this country. Okay. Um, I think we'll, we'll move on to another question. Uh, I, I, this is just a stab at this. Are there any women here who've felt that they in their professions have been harassed in this way? You... I think I have been harassed over yes. the years when I worked as a, as a social worker, most definitely. And I do re recall a, an occasion, and uh, it was a colleague who was inappropriate as so I was getting into my car, and I wound his head in the window. But, <laughs> um, Very I suitable then, punishment. But I then went back and reported it to my female line manager, and I have to say, something was done about it, but it was very sad to find out I actually wasn't his first victim. But what I would like to say to Jeremy is... You need, I'm really surprised you just haven't been watching the news. If you had been, then you would have seen this playing out and that Nick Clegg did start to say, it was a lie, I know nothing about it, I know nothing about this. And then over the days, he started to say, yes, he did. So I can only say to you, if I believe, um, if I believe you, we will both be wrong. What I mean by that is, I'm right, you're wrong, I watched it. <laughs> Yeah, very briefly. Keep it short, so I want to go to another question. I just want to go back to the gentleman's point. I, I just don't want us to focus on the political story. It's a bit like the Savile thing, when the BBC got itself into a huge turmoil about what the BBC knew and when. Fundamentally, there are victims here. We have to listen to them. We have to sort out the problem. I just don't want us to get galloping down a political who said what thing. That's not the problem. The problem is that crimes have potentially been committed. I have no idea. There's certainly a culture that is not healthy, and that's the issue to deal with, not the political sort of nonsense that goes around it. OK. Lakshahao, please. Is it right for Brussels to cap bankers' bonuses? This is the attempt announced today that ba to, ca to cap bankers' bonuses, give them only a bonus equivalent to their salary unless shareholders decide, in which case they can have twice their salary. But is it right for Brussels to do this? Neil Hamilton, you have strong <laughs> views about Europe. Yeah, I do indeed. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, this is the reality of the European Union. And, you know, David Cameron thinks he's going to be able to renegotiate all sorts of powers back from Europe. Uh, here's an issue which goes to the very heart of the city of London's interests, which the government has, uh, has concentrated very strongly on defending and got absolutely nowhere in the negotiations on this directive. It will, of course, not achieve its purpose because the trouble with rules and laws of this kind is that people will always find a way around them. Uh, all right, we may be able to cap bankers' bonuses, but the likely consequence of this change will be that will push up their basic salaries and that will make life much more difficult for the banks because their fixed costs are going to increase very significantly and it's going to be much more difficult for them to get flexibility to iron out the uh, impact of changes in the economic cycle upon them. They like paying by bonuses because that's a performance related element of pay. Uh, so if, if, if we're going, no, but that, as far as looking, look looking at it from the bank's point of view, if the choice is between increasing people's salaries by some colossal amount and yet only paying them sums when the banks make profits, then obviously it's sensible for the banks to choose the latter rather than the former. You'll also have this peculiar situation now where banking is a global business, it's highly competitive. And uh, so uh, it's very footloose and fancy free. With internet trading, these things can be done from anywhere in the world. You'll now have global banks with people doing exactly the same job in Tokyo, New York, Singapore, London, and people in London uniquely having their salaries capped. So where are these people going to go? Away from London. And that means we're all poorer. Paying these bonuses has seemed at times, of course, preposterous. But the Treasury has been the biggest beneficiary in the tax which is charged upon them. Mm -hmm. so, and, that, and so if we lose all that, then, of course, we as individuals are all going to be poorer as well. This is yet another example of politicians in Europe, none of whom have got the slightest experience of what they're doing, uh, who are legislating in a way which is going to cost the earth for us. Okay. And these are the All people right, whose you. only qualification, of mm. course, is that they support the euro, which is the biggest financial calamity which has affected the entire continent. I think we... Calm down. <laughs> <laughs>
Jer Jeremy Brown, can you, as a pro-European, throw light on this? Because if this is under the social policy, Article 151, there's a provision that nothing should apply to pay. Mm. In other words, is it actually permissible for Europe to say that they will control the pay of bankers? Well, my, my, understa that? my understanding is they say this isn't pay, this is... Uh extra to pay and therefore it is within their remit but I'm a member of the government it's not who... pay what well that's it? what they well I'm not I'm not here to answer on behalf of the European Commission I'm no, not but the I just European wonder Commission. what money that I hand to you in return well, for I, I, mean, I, pay. I agree I think it, it looks um, it I mean I agree I find myself in, the, in, a, in a slightly strange position of agreeing with quite a lot of what Neil said which is that um, uh, it might look superficially attractive to a lot of people who are understandably uh, angry and upset about the behaviour of bankers and their uh, seeming contempt in some cases for wider society. But I'm not sure it will achieve the objectives that some people hope it will do. Mm. I think it would be easy to go around. Somebody at the moment who's paid, let's say, a million pounds with a two million pound bonus, does that mean their bonus is going to go down to a million? I don't think it will. I think their basic pay will go up to one and a half million and they'll get the same overall take-home package as they did before. I actually have a sort of ideological issue, which I make a distinction between nationalised banks and... Uh, if you like, non-nationalised banks. I think the nationalised banks need to behave much more like they are public servants, much more respectfully towards the people, you, the taxpayers, who are paying their salaries. But I don't think that government, whether it's in Brussels or in London, has a business of telling private companies that aren't reliant on the state how much they should pay their employees as long as they pay them over the minimum wage. Okay. And the fi final, uh, final, uh, small uh, point, keep it brief, small points of Eurocentric point, within a generation, Europe will have 5% of the world's population and 10% of the world's economy. And this was Neil's point. You know, there is a big world out there in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, New York. London is one of the most important cities in the world. And it's important that we understand that we're competing in a global environment. And I don't want to drive away wealth creators uh, who contribute to our economy and it's not just the richest ones, it's right. people on lower pay with bonuses to other parts just of the world to our detriment. All right. And so you'll uh, fight to oppose this. The man in spectacles there. Is it uh, moral, although, is it moral that a RBS who has lost a loss of colossal 500 million billion because of its PPI misspelled Libor scandal pays 215 mil billion pounds for bonuses for well, people who Well, that's a slightly different it. point. I mean, it's a very good point, but it's a slightly <laughs> different point. We, I want to stick with this idea of capping bonuses. The man in spectacles in the back row there with white hair, you, Hello. sir. Um, yes, thank you, Neil, for your original point. Um, I must say, if um, Chris Hewn had taken your advice on speeding points, we wouldn't be having this by election. What? The scary thing is, you mentioned uh, Mr Cameron negotiating in Europe. The last time we went to negotiate there, we ended up paying more for the EU budget, whilst Germany, France and Italy paid it less. I'm pro-European. The example I take is if I work in a car dealer and I sell ten cars and my colleague sells two cars, I expect to earn more from my colleague. As long as a bonus is performance-related, I find no problem with that. Okay. Ken Loach. Um, isn't it surprising how the rich have to be tempted to work with salaries of millions and the poor have to be driven to work for nothing unless their benefits are cut, uh, or, and they, that seems to be quite wrong. Um, I, I think Neil gave a very long explanation of why banking is a very unsatisfactory way of organising the way we decide what we produce, how we are paid, and how the world is run. This casino banking is actually just gambling by very rich people with your lives and my life, and I think it's, we need a new system. Um, I think the bank should be taken into public ownership, and then we direct what we want to, uh, what we, we should produce, and we uh, direct it in a fair way, we protect the environment, and we live properly. Our RBS is mainly owned uh, by the people, um, and as the gentleman says, it's behaving, I think, very inappropriately, to use the current term for bad behaviour, is behaving inappropriately in um, paying this vast sums to their, um, uh, to their in, in profits to, to so, their So is the EU doing right by trying to cap the bonuses in the way that they've... Yes, the, the EU is absolutely doing right. Okay. Um, I think the EU is wrong in many respects in the way it drives countries to privatise, right. but in this respect I support it. Uh, Angela Eagle, do you support what's been announced in Brussels? Well, firstly, I don't think it should have taken the EU to be doing this. We should have been sorting out our uh, bloated 
bonus culture in our banks much more effectively than this government have done do you, so do, far. Do you approve of what Brussels are doing? I, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I think that do you we've, approve of it? Well, I think that we've got to get a handle on this bloated bonus culture. And I mean, I have to say, I have to, I have to say that when Neil Hamilton says it's all performance related and we've got RBS making a five billion pound loss last year and paying themselves 600 million in bonus, it's a funny definition of performance. Is it Labour policy to support this, which Cameron says he wants to change? We, we want, your view it we be want or not? the government here to sort it out. They should have been doing this earlier. We've got a very large financial sector in the city. What, uh, what we do here will, will be far more effective than what the EU can do. We need to get international agreements to kill the bonus mm. culture and we need to deal with casino banking. It's not in this country's interest to have banks that are so bloated gambling with uh, money and <coughs> gambling with money and our futures. We've but got to make sure that we sorry, bring banking to back to yes, deal with caring casino culture. about its customers. Can I bring you back to the question, Angela, because we haven't got much time. to small business, Can I bring which you back is to what the, it's there to do. The Prime Minister says he wants to, he's worried about this proposal to cap bonuses because of its effect on the banking industry here. Are you worried by it or not? Well, then what he's got to do Are is... Are you worried by it or not? What he's Labour. got to do, what he's got to do is ensure that he can do a deal in Europe that deals with the bloated banking culture and ensures that this country can be properly All looked right. after in its financial sector. But okay. he's got no allies in Europe. He was in a minority of one. Of course, they've got in no Europe. financial services. So yeah. basically, us, what he should be doing is demonstrating that we can put a stop to the bonus culture here. And they have failed. Today okay. we've had Boris Johnson defending bonuses. Uh, we've had uh, everyone on the panel defending bonuses. I must stop you program. Um, Claire Perry. I, you know, I, I sit here and I am absolutely gobsmacked by some of the things you say. Bonuses tripled under your government. The British banking industry was one of the most lightly regulated industries in the world. I worked in financial services. Did you get never big has no, but never has so much never has so much been paid to so many for doing so little on your watch. And what we have to do What we have to do is regulate it properly, which we're doing, to so ring fence the casino banking from the commercial we're banking, not. which we're doing. If Make I may finish, no get the banks lending, which we're doing. They and are by not the way, lending. may I please, would you they please stop lending. interrupting? They are not lending. <laughs> And fundamentally, respect the fact, though, that this is an industry that employs a million people and generates a hundred billion pounds a year in taxes, which funds the public services that we all want. RBS I is sure as right, heck. Don't talk over each other. Is it right or wrong? I sure is it as right as or wrong uh, for Brussels to do Brussels what it's doing? Brussels doesn't question. have a financial services industry. Britain has the biggest financial services industry in Europe, and we need to regulate it properly and regulate bonuses here. It is not up to Brussels. All they're trying to do is grab the British. Okay, one last point, can you say over here on the left? Yes. I seem to remember it's the bankers that got into this, us into this mess. So if, if dropping their bonuses make them go abroad, then I say, good. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. What? Our time's up, so we must end there. Andrew Neil's on next with a special election edition of this week, and they'll have the result of this by-election, which we've been hinting at or trying to guess at. Uh, but he'll have it because they'll be on till the early hours till they actually come through. Next week, Question Time is going to be in Dover. And in Dover, we'll have Melanie Phillips and Bob Crow among our panellists. <laughs> the week after that, we'll be in Cardiff. <laughs> so to come to either programme, apply via our website, that's the best way, or call 0330 My thanks to our panel, to all of you who came from your heavy duties as voters in Eastleigh uh, today uh, for coming here and from Question Time until next Thursday. Good night.